So we're going to talk about acute hypoxemic respiratory failure um, in the next half hour to 45 minutes. And so I'm going to spend some time talking a little bit about uh, the physiology, just so that you understand when, I, when we talk about certain methods, the, what, what the background is. I'm going to try not to get too much into the math of it, but realize there is math. And in a sense, the math helps you understand the, why we focus on various things. Um, and so first, I'm going to point out that I'm not really talking about hypoventilatory respiratory failure, post-op respiratory failure, or respiratory failure associated with shock. We're focusing on the acute hypoxemic respiratory failure here. Um, and so I know that other people talk to you about um, uh, hypoventilatory respiratory failure. Post-op respiratory failure tends to be a bit of both uh, uh, hypoxemic and hypoventilatory where you get progressive atelectasis through a number of reasons. And most of the time, the answer to this is um, treat all the uh, preventative measures. So incentive spirometry, getting people up and mobilizing them, that's not simply because post-op nurses are cruel and unusual uh, punishing people. That's because that's the things that stop this progressive atelectasis. OK, so. In order to talk about acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, we're going to talk a little about oxygen delivery, um, some of the mechanisms of hypoxemia that'll set us up to then go into the how we treat uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. So this is the single alveolus model of oxygen delivery. And in this particular model, we think of the heart isn't even on there. The heart is a blind pump. It just pumps the blood that returns back to it. Um, and so the amount of oxygen we deliver, um, and unfortunately half that is off the screen. I think it's just uh, projecting at a different size. OK. There we go. Now you can actually see all the breath. OK, so um, oxygen delivery is cardiac output times a, a content, arterial oxygen content. And this equation you've seen before, 1.36 times hemoglobin times the percent set. That's the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin. And this 0.03 times PaO2 is the amount that's dissolved in blood. And so if I put normal numbers in there and a hemoglobin of 15, a set of 100%, um, that this number, the content, is about 20. This 0.3 here is so small, in general, we ignore it because that's where all the... Um, he, that's where all the oxygen is being delivered. So, oxygen delivery, sometimes called QO2 or DO2, then is your cardiac output times that arterial content. Again, if I put normal numbers in there, that's 5 liters per minute is your um, cardiac output, the content of 20, I multiply and change um, units, and we have, we're delivering 1,000 mLs uh, per minute of oxygen normally. This big black box, then, is just the body. And you consume some amount of oxygen, and you produce some amount of CO2 from that. Again, if I'm going to put normal numbers in here, normal oxygen consumption in someone who's not being too active is about 250 mLs per minute, which then makes mixed venous is then whatever's delivered minus the, uh, that that's consumed. So again, put these normal numbers in, 1,000 mLs per minute delivered, 250 um, extracted, what returns is 750. I can do those backwards numbers and say the arterial or the venous mixed venous content is 15. Your mixed venous O2 then is about 75%. So normal mixed venous set 75%. Okay, that's normal. We'll come back to this um, in a minute. So. Now let's talk about hypoxemia. And to do that, we switch to this 2 alveolus model and recognize that the, we're just focusing on the mixed venous comes back here, half the blood goes to this alveolar unit, half goes to that one, comes out the arterial side. Now, your P big AO2, that's the alveolar gas equation. FiO2 times atmospheric pressure minus water vapor pressure minus your PCO2 over the respiratory quotient we rarely measure people's respiratory quotient and says about 0.8. But again, if someone's breathing room air, um, PCO2 is normal. Your P big AO2 is about 100. Okay. And so let's just say for these particular um, uh, examples that the person is sick. 
they're extracting a lot. Their mixed venous content has dropped to 10. Now, normally, my lungs work. I can be an elite athlete. My consumption can go up sky high, drop my mixed venous very low, but you will never desaturate from a low mixed venous because this low mixed venous comes back, everything passes by a, a functioning alveolus, and gets oxygenated and good spit out the other side as a normal content. Okay, so these are mechanisms of hypoxemia, VQ mismatch, shunt, hypoventilation, and then in theory, I suppose, decrease FiO2 and diffusion limitation. But really, the big ones you're going to see are VQ mismatch and shunt. So what's the difference between that? So this would be an example of VQ mismatch. I'm not ventilating this particular lung unit, and so the PCO2 rises to 100. And so then, as I go through this alveolar gas equation, breathing room air with a PCO2 of 100, this P big A O2 drops to 25. Now, mixed venous again comes back at 10. The stuff that goes by the normal alveolus gets oxygenated, comes out the other side with a, a content of 20. The stuff that comes by this side, well, this PaO2 is only 25, and so the not much is going to change. That comes out the other side as 10. When they mix, you can't just average out their saturations or anything else. You have to average their contents. So now your arterial content is 15. Do the reverse math. Your PO2 is 40. That's VQ mismatch. So VQ mismatch response to oxygen, right? I do these same numbers, and I put the person on a 40% face mask. So now all of a sudden, your FiO2 here changes from 0.21 to 0.4. PCO2 stays the same. Now your P big AO2 is 160. Again, content can come back at 10, goes by both sides oxygenated, your PA2 is normal. There it is. Okay. Ah, but shunt. So this would be an example of shunt. This particular alveolar unit is flooded. What, it is, what is it flooded with? Blood, pus, or water? Um, doesn't really matter. It's flooded. So now, um, so the PaO2 on this side is still normal, but this is flooded. And so this mixed content comes back at 10. The stuff that passes by normal alveolus comes out the other side as 20. This passes by nothing, comes out at 10. Your content is 15. Your PO2 is 40, just like with the VQ mismatch example. But this doesn't respond to oxygen, right? So let's not screw around. We'll put this person on the ventilator, put them on 100%. So, whoa, how did I do that? Awesome. Whoops. Okay, lung cancer. So, pleural fluid, oh wait, no, now I'm really lost. <laughs> Hold on. I just need to, there we go. Where's yours? It was that way. That way? I see it right there. You see it? Not, yeah, yeah, okay, so I be, you have to be careful with my pointing from now on. So I'm going to intubate this person, put them on 100%. So this doesn't change at all. That's flooded. And your content of 10 still goes by nothing and comes back a content of 10. This side, now on 100%, your P big AO2 is 650. Now if we go back to that content equation, I've just been focusing on this part of the equation because that's the only important part, and this we can neglect. Uh, until your PaO2 starts to get up to be 650, then all of a sudden that's meaning that starts to contribute. And so now as opposed to a content of 20 on this side, content of 22. Um, so we average those two out, um, and you can't see it over here, but now your content is 16, your PO2 is 50. So shunt. I put the person on 100%. And their PO2 went from 40 to 50. So not much happened there. Ah, but here's the important thing. Shunt does respond to changes in mixed penis. So in this particular case, what I'm going to do is take that same person who had 50% shunt, leave them on room air, and now, instead of doing anything with their ventilator, I'm going to change their mixed penis from 10 to 15. I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do that. I'm just going to say that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take their mixed venous from being low to being normal. Now, what I've just done is this still gets oxygenated as 20. This is now 15. 
your um, arterial content is 17 and a half, your PO2 is now 58. So I took someone with a PO2 of 40, put them on 100%, didn't get much response, but I changed their mix venous and I get a much bigger response. And so shunt might not respond to um, changes in FiO2. It is, becomes extraordinarily dependent on your mixed venous. And so, um, so this is just saying in paragraph form, because that direct admixture, the fact that your mixed venous is passing by any oxygenation and getting right, dumped right out to the arterial side, any changes in mixed venous directly translated to changes in arterial R2, which is not true with normal lungs. Okay, so we'll come back to that and how do we do that in just a second. So acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, in general, it's shunt. It's severe hypoxemia not responding to high flow oxygen. And so shunt due to alveolar filling and what's the filling from? It's either blood, alveolar hemorrhage, pus, which is pneumonia, or water. And that water can either be high pressure pulmonary edema or low pressure pulmonary edema. In general, these here um, are much easier to deal with than the low pressure pulmonary edema, which is ARDS. You can also lump this and split this up to either focal lung lesions or diffuse lung lesions. Um, why bother? Well, focal lung lesions. So right lower lobe pneumonia. If you think about it, you can have right lower lobe complete atelectasis, or you can take out the right lower lobe, and you don't get hypoxic. So why can people get this hypoxic with low bar pneumonias? Well, with atelectasis, um, you get hypoxic <coughs> pulmonary vasoconstriction. So you don't ventilate that right lower lobe, but you're also not perfusing it, and so you don't tend to get hypoxemic. With pneumonia, there's this big inflammatory response, lots of cytokines, and so you're actually getting more blood flow to that area than you normally do. And so no ventilation, um, increased perfusion, um, big problem. So, okay, the other problem with it is might not respond to PEEP at all. So PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, we think of as distending alveoli, redistributing lung water, improving oxygenation. But if only the right lower lobe is consolidated and you add PEEP, you will over distend the normal lung and not do anything about that consolidated. And so typically you add PEEP and what you'll see is no improvement in oxygenation and maybe even a worsening. If you increase PEEP in normal lung, you can end up turning it into zone one lung. And if you remember west zones of the lung, zone one is alveolar pressure greater than arterial pressure um, or capillary pressure and that turns into dead space. So you can make everything worse. What do they respond to? Gravity. Position these people good lung down and you tend to um, force more blood flow to go to normal lung than abnormal lung. Um, rarely um, need split lung ventilation and I guess the good news about um, severe acute hypoxemic respiratory failure from focal lung lesions is it doesn't stay focal for very long. If it's that bad it almost always either it'll either resolve or it'll progress to um, a diffuse lung lesion. Okay, so that brings us to ARDS. So ARDS is a syndrome, which means it's a collection of the signs and symptoms, and just diagnosing someone as having ARDS is not the same as diagnosing what that underlying problem is. And there's the definition. Bilateral infiltrates, a low wedge pressure, and if you're not measuring wedge pressure, no evidence that they're volume overloaded, and a PF ratio of under 200. So they're hypoxemic, they've got bilateral infiltrates, they don't have elevated uh, filling pressures. Now, you have a picture in your mind of what that actually means, which is bilateral diffuse infiltrates. But recognize for all the trials they've done for ARDS, the, you could have a right upper lobe pneumonia and left lower lobe collapse, and those meet these criteria. And so the, you'd say, but yeah, that really is an ARDS. But the, even the people who run the ARDS trials can't totally um, um, agree on what is and what is an ARDS. So again, sometimes people will split up ARDS into direct or indirect. That is just the, is the primary problem inside the lung, pneumonia, aspiration, inhalational injury, or is it outside the lung, sepsis, with ARDS. Um, 
why bother to split this up? There are some people who believe that there's some fundamental difference between these. Um, and none of the studies has it really shown that there is any fundamental difference between how these really respond. And again, we tend to think of them as being this diffuse process, but when you actually scan these people, it's not diffuse at all. It's very heterogeneous. Okay, so what's our treatment? Careful search for the underlying cause. Again, if this is sepsis and SIRS leading to ARDS, if you do not identify the source of the infection and eliminate it, you want to, all the rest of this is buying time for something. Um, and without stopping the process, the, that doesn't work. Then we'll talk about restricted fluid management, maximize the mixed venous, what we can do with the ventilator, permissive hypercapnia, and then some salvage therapies. So, restricted fluid management. Now, I've said, by definition, in ARDS, the filling pressures aren't high. But there is some pressure that is forcing um, fluid out through leaky capillaries. And lowering that filling pressure can minimize the amount of water uh, that ends up being extravasated into the lung. So, most people will sum this management up by trying to achieve the lowest filling pressure um, consistent with an adequate cardiac output. And recognize, although this sounds really easy, um, everything else I'm going to be doing affects the cardiac output. And so I can diary someone today to say I want them as dry as they can possibly be, but if I'm doing that at the same time as I'm cranking up airway pressures on the ventilator, that combination, dry, high intrathoracic pressures, add to the um, decreased venous return, decreased preload, decreased cardiac output. And so this is always a moving target. What might be the right volume today is certainly not going to be the right volume tomorrow after I do a bunch of other things. There was a trial called the FACT trial that looked at this. Is this the right way to do it? Conservative versus liberal fluid strategies, um, and they used extraordinarily explicit protocols. Now, there are a lot of um, people who will complain about this trial because by setting out these explicit protocols, that isn't really the way we do things. Um, but it's as good as you're going to get in a trial. No change in mortality, but some improved oxygenation scores, increased ventilator-free days. Um, and no increased rates of renal failure, dialysis, other organ failure. So most people will st still attempt to do this. Lowing fi lowest filling pressure consistent with an adequate cardiac output. Okay, maximize mixed venous. Now, I just showed you um, in that math, and the whole reason to go through that math was to get the point of the mixed venous is really, really important. As a matter of fact, often on morning rounds, the story we will hear is ARDS patient, they desaturated overnight, we turned their FiO2 up to 100%, blah, 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 they had a fever. And realize that story actually is the patient had a fever, they increased their oxygen consumption, they uh, dropped their mixed venous, and then they desaturated. And the answer there is not crank up the FiO2, because really, you can do it, but it's not going to get you a whole lot. The answer is um, address the fever and the oxygen uh, consumption problem. So, if we're going to maximize the mixed venous, we've got two very, uh, I, well, we actually have five variables, I think, but we've got two ways to do it. Decreased consumption, increased delivery. So, decreased consumption. What it, so, the jet being febrile can certainly, so these are all patient issues. The patient is breathing spontaneously, 20% of your cardiac output can go to your um, respiratory muscles. So don't let them breathe spontaneously. Um, if they're agitated and moving around, sedate them and take that away. If they're febrile, cool them. But in cooling them, if you allow them to shiver, that skyrockets your oxygen consumption. And so don't let people shiver. Um, okay. And then increase the delivery. Now realize, mathematically, there are three variables in delivery, and that's cardiac output, hemoglobin, and percent SAD. And the SAD is the one that we can't change, and so these are the other two. Um, and from the mathematics of your mixed venous, whether you increase your hemoglobin 10% or your cardiac output 10% um, to compensate for a SAD that's down 10%, it all looks the same to the mixed venous. Now, 
you should look at that and be extraordinarily skeptical because we've done these trials. We've done the crank the hemoglobin. Should we, should our trigger for a hemoglobin be six, seven, nine, ten? What should it be? No difference. So yes, no difference if you take all comers in every intensive care unit, no difference in mortality in the whether you're a liberal or restrictive with your blood transfusion. But maybe these people were having problems with um, oxygen delivery, maybe their hemoglobin should be higher. We've also done the increased cardiac output study a long time ago. We um, put people on uh, with sepsis on dobutamine and ran their cardiac outputs to supraphysiologic levels didn't improve outcomes, actually made them a little bit worse. But again, these people, if we have any sense that their cardiac output isn't what it should be, we probably should look to boost that. Now in the old days, and I'm talking back when I was a fellow, which was a really long time ago, everyone with ARDS had a swan in, and so you'd measure this. And so the first call we would get would be your mixed venous is dropping, and then would come the, and then all the rest of this is happening. And so it was much easier to see that and to see, okay, I'm going to do this intervention. How does it change my mixed venous and how does it change my oxygenation? Um, without that information, most of the time, what you will see us all do is guess at this. They look like they're still moving around. I'm going to increase their sedation. And the E, this is still happening. Maybe I'll try, maybe I'll paralyze them for a short time. Maybe I'll do this. But the most of this, we're operating without knowing I'd like their mixed venous to be higher if I do this intervention. More volume, less volume, whatever, is it going to change the mixed venous? And so, in a sense, most of the time, we're operating without knowing these numbers. Next comes the ventilator. Okay, so we can put some pe uh, people on the ventilator. In general, we do, and then here are the things we can look at. So there's um, the whole rationale behind this is I can certainly make ARDS worse with the ventilator. How can I make it worse? Well, pressures, so barotrauma. Pressures get high enough, things pop. Um, when alveoli pop and rupture into the mediastinum, you have mediastinal pneumomediastinum. It can rupture interstitially, and you'll have interstitial emphysema, or rupture into the pleural space, and you'll have pneumothoraces. Then there's something called volume trauma. So this is essentially saying that I can take normal lungs, studies with animals, you put them on a ventilator pre um, and ventilate them with high tidal volumes, and you will cause something that looks exactly like ARDS in a very short time. So it seems that the wall shear stress that is caused by allowing alveoli to collapse, open, and then over distend causes a bunch of inflammation, releases cytokines, propagates ARDS. So whatever we do, we should try to um, not do, uh, not make things worse. How do we? Um, Monitor the are we over distending things in general. This is going to be airway pressures. Then again, ventilator pushes a tidal volume in, you get a peak pressure, you stop flow, you have a plateau, um, and then breath comes out and you have your end expiratory pressure. And I put this in just to tell you that the end we're all going to focus on what this plateau pressure is. You could, or the ventilator could, calculate compliance for you and realize low numbers are bad, normal is above 60. Down to 30 is when we start talking about severe ARDS. Okay, so of these things I can set on the ventilator. Well, there's the FI2. In general, you intubate the patient. You start at 100%. You try to decrease it to non-toxic levels. And realize when most of us throw that term around, it's neither scientific nor anything else. But we say that in general, we'd like to get the FI2 down to below 60, 65% before we can win will say that I'm not so worried about it anymore. PEEP. PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. Again, the idea here is distend alveoli, redistribute lung water. Um, and what we'd like to do is use enough PEEP to uh, avoid this, allowing uh, alveoli to collapse, recruitment, derecruitment, um, but also not so much that we're over distending things. So there are three schools of thought to how we should use PEEP. There are the least peepists, the best peepists, and the open lung peepists. In a sense, they're kind of like religions in that the one you're raised in tends to be the one you stick with despite any um, 
any sort of evidence to the contrary. So least peepists. Least peepists believe that peep is a necessary evil. We should use the least amount of peep to give us a saturation over 90% on a non-toxic FiO2. Best peepists. Best peepists construct a, um, a compliance curve. So set the peep at 5, measure compliance. Set it at uh, 6, 7, 8, construct compliance. And what you'll see is as peep is recruiting the lung, your compliance improves. When it starts to overdistend the lung, your compliance starts to um, worsen again. <coughs> and so you construct that curve, pick out the um, best PEEP. And uh, that's how you choose PEEP. Now when you look at ARDS studies, least PEEPIS and best PEEPIS tend to come up with numbers that are very close. Somewhere in the 8 range, uh, centimeters of water range of PEEP. And so again, going back to my religion al uh, analogy, you can think of the least peepus and the best peepus as Anglicans and Episcopalians. They're really kind of close and almost interchangeable. Open lung peepus. Okay, so open lung um, peep believe that it, similar to best peepus, but taking it one step further, I make a dynamic inflation curve and then I set the peep above the lower inflection point. So what does that mean? It means creating a pressure volume curve. So ARDS patient, paralyzed, a liter glass syringe, you inflate the lung and then allow it to deflate and you get this hysteresis curve. And then you point to this and call this a lower inflection point, you call that an upper inflection point, you add enough peep to get a, uh, above this lower inflection point, the idea here is you're allowing alveoli to collapse and above this upper inflection point you're over distending the lung. The math geeks in the room should realize neither of these are actually inflection points. Your inflection point is right there, but okay, we'll uh, let them slide. The, we'll let the physiologists who came up with this slide on the fact that they can't actually pick out an inflection point. So the idea here is um, enough peep to get above this point, small enough tidal volume, so you're always ventilating right in here. Okay, um, and those are your danger zones. So. Um, right, so what's the problem with this? Well, one, you have to paralyze the patient and have a liter glass syringe. Um, and um, this was the trial and the Amato trial. People will refer to, wow, that was already back in 1998. That's so long ago. So this was a trial where they looked at this. Um, so um, if you look at this, you'll see tidal volumes here, much smaller than tidal volumes there, peep much larger than there. And so in most open lung trials, this is the difference right here. So least peepists are coming up with eta peep. Um, open lung peepists are up in the 16 range. Now, um, and then uh, you can see mortality here, 38%. Uh, and in this group, 71%. So huge advantage here. Okay, so what are the problems with this trial? Well, one, you're changing both tidal volume and peep at the same time. So which is the actual benefit? And two, if you look at every other ARDS trial out there, the mortality is in the 35 to 40% range. So it really looks like we systematically killed the control group here as opposed to um, helping the intervention group. Um, so it was a small study also. There is this unusually high mortality in the control group. The most common cause of ARDS, leptospirosis. And so a lot of people will look at a South American trial where leptospirosis was the most common cause of ARDS and totally um, ignore it. Um, but more, more likely this was the start of the hint, um, changing too many things and not totally sure that that's the exact answer. Which brings us to the, well, what is the right tidal volume? Um, historically, we set tidal volumes to normalize the PCO2 and pH, but then realized that in doing that, you get more volume trauma. And so maybe airway pressures and volumes are way more important than the CO2 is. So there are a bunch of small trials. The results are conflicting. They decide, here it is. We're going to set up this enormous trial to answer the question. It's the ARDS-NET trial. And so they randomize people to either traditional ventilation, 12 cc's per kilo tidal volumes, limit your plateau pressures to under 50, or low tidal volume, 6 cc's per kilo plateau pressures under 30. Lockstep FiO2 and PEEP, big multi-center trial. They're basically looking at mortality. Um, so a couple of um, points here to re realize is when they're talking about cc's per kilo, this isn't kilo of actual body weight, it's predicted weight. 
And why do I point that out? Because in America, at least, everybody's um, predicted weight is way below your actual weight. And so that even when people think they're doing 6 cc per kilo, they're probably not doing 6 cc per kilo by this trial because the, um, you even have to undershoot that to really get down to it. But anyway, what were the results? So um, a lot of patients, 400. Um, you're, again, in the low tidal volume group, they did exactly what they wanted, 6 cc per kilo. The traditional group, 12 cc per kilo. Their PEEP wasn't all that different. Plateau pressures were different, as they sort of suspected. Mortality, big difference here. And this is more on the line of what you might expect to see, 31 versus 39%. More patients weaned, more ventilator-free days. So, fabulous. Wonderful. Everybody thought we finally have the answer. And then a year later, a guy by the name of Chuck Natanson started writing articles suggested that maybe um, that wasn't the answer. Um, maybe instead of actually helping the, uh, the 60 cc per kilo group, maybe we were actually harming the control group. And um, put it in this bigger setting of the maybe that's what we've been doing with a lot of critical care trials. And what he predicted without seeing the data um, and without actually being a ventilator guy, he's an anesthesiologist who does sepsis research. What he predicted was that people entered the trial at probably this mid-range tidal volume, 8 cc's per kilo. We randomized some of them down and some of them up. And maybe you prove that 6 cc's is better than 12 cc's, but maybe the 8 cc's that they came in on would have been the best. I mean, so yes, this point is better than that point, but is there some point in between that would have been best? And, and again, recognize that if we did that, what we actually did is, again, we harmed the control group. So, initially, greeted with a bunch of anger, let's say, might be the right way to put it. Um, and people said, no way is that true, can't possibly be. And critiqued this guy because he doesn't know ventilators, what's he talking about? And they w one, they wouldn't share uh, the initial data with him. And the initial tri ARDSnet trial published in the New England Journal. ICACR's rebuttal published in a different journal. The New England Journal wouldn't even publish it. So. Um, pretty big controversy. Eventually, they actually gave him the data, and he looked at it. And so um, what these all are, this graph here, is these are all the tidal volume trials um, in ARDS. And realize there have been um, two trials that show a big benefit to low tidal volumes, and three or more trials that showed no benefit. So what he did was looked at, this is the, um, uh, the intervention group, and this is the control group in all the studies. And what he did was looked at what happened to the plateau pressure before and after randomization. So in all these groups, in the control, here's the pre-randomization uh, uh, plateau pressure, and here's the post. So in all of them, they did what they thought, which was lower the, um, the uh, plateau pressure. But here's the difference. Um, in the control group, in the three studies that don't show a benefit, your plateau pressure stayed about the same. And the two studies that do show a big benefit, your plateau pressures rose. Um, and so that's both the Amato trial and the ARDSnet trial. And so again, he makes this incredibly powerful argument, what we're actually doing was harming the, interven uh, harming the control group as opposed to helping the intervention group. So what's the right answer with tidal volumes? Um, so, Nobody really knows right now, but probably in the 6 to 8 cc's per kilo. And then looking back at that um, previous chart, recognize that maybe more importantly is plateau pressure. And when Dr. Tobin will say plateau pressure under 32, he's picking that number not out of the blue, but out of this graph right here and showing that any um, of these control groups where they raised the plateau pressure over 32 were the ones where they harmed it. There will be people out of Vanderbilt, Wes Ely, who will say, no, 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 they've got some data that lower is better for plateau pressure, that there is a survival benefit as you walk down this plateau pressure. But again, maybe the answer isn't necessarily what the tidal volume is, but what the plateau pressure is. Realizing when we do that, when we lower tidal volumes, um, it comes at a cost, and that cost is the CO2 is going to rise. But at this point, what we've decided is that a normal CO2 um, is uh, 
a normal CO2 at the expense of high airway pressures is far more dangerous than um, uh, normal airway pressures with the high CO2. And so we let the CO2 rise. We don't care about it. Maybe that respiratory acidosis, there's some studies that show that it might even be protective. And so yes, I let the CO2 rise and I don't care about it for the most part. Now, it used to be prone positioning, I would throw in the salvage therapy because um, the idea behind it is better VQ, better VQ matching, some increase in FRC, change diaphragm motion, all of it. Um, there have been a, a bunch of small studies that had shown transient improvement in oxygenation, no survival benefit. So we threw it in the, um, in the uh, salvage of I can't do anything else. But then came this study just this year where they looked at severe ARDS, PF ratio under 150, who were bad. You have FO2 over 60% uh, PEEP above 5, already having small tidal volumes, had been on the ventilator for under 36 hours, and they proned them all for 16 hours a day. Um, and you did it until their PF ratio improved. You were on less than 10 of PEEP and under 60%. And the, here's the survival difference, is that's a really impressive curve of um, survival benefit for proning these patients. And so um, I don't know uh, how everybody has come to resolve the fact that this is incredibly impressive data, but this is the first study that's shown this. All the other studies that have looked at this has, haven't. Is it that these people prone people for longer each day or they were just proning severe ARDS? We don't know, but I would say that this has to go from salvage therapy to at least I've got to consider it in severe ARDS. Okay, so that all being said, what would my typical uh, initial ventilator settings be uh, for ARDS? Assist control, tidal volume 6 to 8 cc's per kilo, FI to 100%, PEEP start at 5, and I'm in the least PEEP school, so I'm going to increase my PEEP until I get to a non-toxic FiO2. I'm going to maintain plateau pressures under that 32 range. Um, okay. So how about drug therapies for ARDS? Um, and so this list is probably longer. I stopped um, updating it a while ago. There have been tons of studies and various drugs in ARDS, and none of them work. Which brings us to th salvage therapy. So we've tried everything else. None of it's worked. Um, what else can we do? Recognize that none of these would be salvage therapies if we could prove they actually worked. So um, they're in the salvage therapies uh, because they've been studied and don't work. High frequency ventilation where you're lowering the tidal volume to well below anatomic dead space and cranking up the rate. Um, and realize that the in this hole, I do not want to either over distend the alveoli or allow it to collapse. This should be the ultimate because most time in high frequency, what you're doing is alveoli stays the same size as you stream gas in and out of it. Should be the ultimate in not wanting to either over distend or allow it to collapse. Problems with it is they've studied this and another study just came out, which is probably, I think, the death knell of even having this in the salvage therapy category. Um, it just doesn't improve survival and it's not so easy to use. Nitric oxide. So um, it is an inhaled potent pulmonary vasodilator with a very short half-life. So in theory, if you inhaled the nitric oxide, it would only go to areas that were ventilated and it would be a vasodilator so you could match ventilation and perfusion. Fabulous idea. Again, anecdotal response uh, reports showing some response. Clinical trials haven't um, um, shown a big benefit and extraordinarily expensive. So at least for the next year and a half, for which time it will be extraordinarily expensive, the, um, probably not um, used in ARDS. Ah, but ECMO is the one salvage therapy that probably should be in here. So extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So the idea here is I can put a large bore catheter in through the IJ. This sits right at the, it's got two lumens in it, and it sits with one lumen right in the right atrium, one in the inferior vena cava. Blood gets sucked it up in the inferior vena cava, comes out here, scrub CO2, oxygenated by an oxygenator, pumped back into the right atrium. Um, and so, do the entire work of the lungs. Scrub CO2 and oxygenate. You can ventilate the patient, you cannot ventilate the patient. The, um, you don't necessarily have to. 
Now, for there, you can do this AV, so pull blood off venous and pump it in arterial. There are people who will do it the opposite. Pull blood off PA, artery, um, and pump it back in um, vein. Um, or you can go off femoral vessels. Um, for the most part, with this, veno, venous, ECMO, with one catheter here, um, the amount of flow you can get here before you start recirculating is great for CO2 removal. So if your problem is A or DS, I can't get the CO2 down below 100, fabulous, really good, and it's a bridge to something. Either their lungs are going to improve or we're going to transplant them. Great. Um, but you can't get flows high enough in just doing ven this veno venous to really get great oxygenation. Um, and so the, it's kind of limited in most severe ARDS um, uh, studies. So multi-center CSER trial um, that's published in the Lancet in 2009 showed ECMO improved survival, but so did transfer for evaluation, meaning that the way they did this was um, everybody got transferred into a couple of centers for treatment for ARDS. And at that center, after they did everything else, they decided uh, ECMO or no ECMO. Um, and so the, what they decided was just transferring people into specialized centers, you improve ARDS survival. ECMO probably does on top of that when used in the correct hands. Um, so who should we consider ECMO for? Single organ failure, who are young, um, and it's a bridge to something else. We used to use this as salvage therapy very late in the disease, so they're not recovering, I need to do something. But probably the studies that are about to come out next are all going to be up front. So if someone comes in with severe ARDS, I put them on ECMO right away. I ventilate them to minimize any sort of damage the ventilator might cause um, and use ECMO as their bridge to survival. And that data is probably still a year or so away, but when that comes out, I have a feeling we changed the way we use ECMO from end stage, um, from severe salvage in the this has been going on for so long to um, it might be done in specialized center up front where you essentially have ECMO teams. Um, and that I think is the promise for how this might work in the future. Downside to this, big honking catheter. These people have to be anticoagulated so much um, that you're following ACTs and not heparin and they will all ooze. They will ooze from that catheter. They will ooze from everywhere. Um, and, so, and infection. And so this in general, although there are places who will do more echo, ECCO, extracorporeal CO2 removal, as a bridge to transplant. And I know that has been brought up in Jason's hands up here. In the uh, CO2s are really high. Could we do that as a bridge to retransplant? Um, and again, that's great because these machines at lower flows, fabulous at scrubbing CO2. Um, but the doing this, and so there are centers that will do this. You will see, you can find online pictures of patient trached walking around the unit on ECMO awaiting transplant. Great. Um, probably not so much with oxygenation, uh, with severe um, oxygenation problems because Again, need higher flows, need those patients more sedated, and probably not as easy to do.